Okay, hi everybody, um, and thanks for the invitation. I hoped I would uh, be on the Institute lawns today, but that, that didn't work in the end. Um, I'll talk about legal theorems of privacy, which may sound a bit, a bit strange. Uh, how uh, do you uh, combine with uh, legal and theorems? And um, I hopefully will, will give some answers to that. Uh, the talk is mostly based on recent work with Aloni Cohen, who's also on the call. And, but this is part of a, a kind of longer term project with many participants, including uh, that originated at the uh, Privacy Tools project at Harvard. And this includes social scientists, computer scientists, and legal scholars. And I should say I'm not a lawyer, so none of this is legal advice or anything like that. If you need a lawyer, go to a lawyer. So I'll talk about data privacy. And the problem is as follows. We collect a lot of personal data. This is now uh, an everyday thing. Uh, we use it in computations like statistical analysis or machine learning analysis to produce some useful outcomes. And these are possible outcomes that you uh, may think of. And the problem is how to compute and release functions, useful functions of the data set. But because the data set contains sensitive personal information, we would like also to protect individual privacy. And of course, to be able to answer uh, this question, we need to also answer this question. What do we mean when we speak about protecting individual privacy? What is privacy? And privacy is a, a, like a concept that has been discussed in many literatures. And are there noise? Uh, and um, but also in computer science and, and, and of course in legal writing. And when we look at um, what happened in uh, computer science in the kind of 20 last years, uh, we see some technical privacy concepts that were suggested, of which I will just mention two. Uh, K anonymity and differential privacy. And I will define these two very briefly later on. I have to say this is not a talk about differential privacy, even though the concept is mentioned. And when we look at these concepts, they are defined using mathematical language. They attempt to offer general privacy protection and also seek to provide as much as possible provable privacy guarantees. And again, the same conundrum, what do we mean by provable privacy guarantees if it's hard to understand what privacy means? On the other hand, we see uh, legal privacy concepts. And so these are the two families of concepts that I will focus on today. And these privacy concepts appear in a host of um, of um, um, uh, legal documents, uh, like laws and regulations. I just uh, mentioned three of them here. FERPA and HIPAA are US regulations and people counted probably more than a thousand regulations in the US that are relevant for privacy. In Europe, there's the new uh, general data protection regulation which is trying to uh, be a little more general than the US case. But if you look further into these documents, you see a plethora of concepts like PII, anonymization, linkability, singling out that we'll talk about today, inference risk, opt out, and many more. And these are, are supposed to describe our societal privacy expectations. Unfortunately for us, they are not formal from a mathematical standpoint. So we cannot work with them directly when we reason about privacy in systems. Uh, they are often sector-based. So the definitions differ between different regulations. PII is one uh, prominent example that um, uh, is defined somewhat differently in almost every regulation, depending on the sector uh, that is relevant. And furthermore, because many of these were written originally 30 or 40 years ago, uh, there are expectations that are often expectations that are in disagreement with our current 
scientific understanding of uh, uh, in information privacy. So we would like to put these two uh, uh, parts of the puzzle and try to fit them together. And as you see, it's not that easy to fit them together. So can we come up with a third piece that will allow us to bridge between the legal and technical? Okay. And this is what we'll try uh, to see, uh, to, to, to do in this uh, talk. Of course, it's a big problem, so we're, I'm not going to solve it. But hopefully we'll show that there is some chance of uh, uh, finding this uh, bridging piece and furthermore reasoning about it with the rigor that we like and love. So uh, in the rest of the talk, I'll uh, begin by presenting two uh, technical concepts, anonymity and differential privacy, uh, very briefly. And then I'll move on to uh, the main part, which is computer science and privacy law. And this is by itself too wide. So I will just uh, really touch upon some related work. And then I'll move to our example of formalizing this concept that is called uh, singling out that comes from the uh, EU's uh, GDPR. And then uh, we'll summarize and have some time for questions, I hope. Uh, I have to say that uh, this is a talk, this is based on a presentation that I used uh, too many times and I felt about that it would be boring to reuse it again. So uh, today is the first time that you are seeing a modified version of this talk, but the downside is that I'm not sure I've timed it correctly. I removed some information, uh, some, some parts, added some parts, and let's see how that goes. So what is anonymity? I'm pretty sure many of us, many of you have heard of this concept. It uh, was motivated by work by Samarati and Sweeney about 20 years ago. Uh, and it was motivated by an attack that Latanya Sini uh, performed on uh, medical information uh, anonymously, supposedly anonymously published in, uh, in, um, in Massachusetts. So, anonymity is a process that takes a data set and makes it anonymous, meaning that information is suppressed uh, in order to prevent the possibility to identify uh, individual uniquely. And more uh, concretely, you would like that the identifying information would appear at least k times in the data set. Maybe this is best illustrated by an example. Uh, suppose this is our hospital data set. And suppose we believe that, uh, as you see, names uh, and addresses were removed here, so we don't have directly identifying information. But suppose we believe that zip code, age, and sex could also be used as an alternative way to identify individuals. Actually, this is exactly what happened in Latina Sweeney's uh, attack about 20 years ago. She used zip code, age, and sex as an alternative. Uh, uh, Quasi what you call the quasi identifier. So um, we could take this data set and uh, by suppressing some of the information, you see the age of the first uh, patient has been suppressed and similar the sex. And in this case, I created the two uh, anonymous data sets. So if you will check, you will see that every identifying row appears at least twice, in this case, exactly twice. And so uh, this prevents some kinds of attacks. So for instance, if I know that my 50-year-old uh, female neighbor from zip code 23456 two, went to the hospital, um, I would not be able to identify her role in the two anonymous data set. It could either be the first one or the last one. And hence, maybe I would not be able to tell whether she had a heart disease or a viral disease. But you can see that this is not always protecting people. For instance, if uh, this, this person's, uh, yeah, I will not know whether my friend from zip code 12345, who's 30 years old and male, uh, <coughs> whether his role in the data set is the first or the second from the two, but I will learn uh, their disease. So the question is whether anonymity provides privacy in this elusive uh, concept. 
And it seems that maybe yes, many regulations, at least in the US, but also in Europe, uh, seem to equate privacy and anonymity. And anonymity has anonymity in, in the name, so it must be anonymity. And <clears throat> It's a concept that people take as in, easy to understand. It's a syntactic condition on the outcome of the anonymization process. For us computer scientists, the fact that it's a syntactic condition raises a red flag. It follows the kind of attack that Latanya Sweeney performed 20 years ago. So at least that is positive. But on the other hand, people have found other attacks. For instance, the homogeneity attack is what I showed in the previous slide. And in order to counter these attacks, they changed chaonymity. So we now have uh, variants called L diversity, P closeness, and people have been using other letters. <clears throat> and more seriously, maybe, some work has shown that, uh, the, that chaonymity is not robust to composition. So if you have several chaonymized uh, data sets, whether they are this, uh, based on the same data or related data sets, when you put them together, you lose canonymity. This has been shown in uh, theoretical work by Ganta et al. in 2008, and they also provided some simulations and some and, and more recent work by Lonnie Cohen <coughs> demonstrates that this actually happens with a real world data set. So going back to this question, I don't think it's easy to answer this, uh, whether canonymity provides privacy just based on what we see here. The second concept I want to present is differential privacy. This is work by uh, the work McSherry, myself, and Smith in, in 2008. And we say that the computation is differentially private if any information related risk to a person does not change significantly as a result of that person's information being included or not included in the analysis. If you look at a picture, <clears throat> to describe this by a picture, in the real world, some data is fed into a computation. And so we see an outcome. Of course, the picture is usually much, much more complicated. We have feedbacks and so on that I have abstracted away from the description here. But even here, I would be worried because my data, my personal data could be part of this data set. And if this is the case, then the computation, it could be leaked through the computation in the outcome. I would be feel much better if the same computation would be performed with my data omitted, okay? And, but this does not happen in the real world. This is only my ideal world. So what I would require is that the outcome in the real world and the ideal world would be somewhat similar. There's a measure of similarity that we usually use the letter epsilon to denote. And this is the mathematical definition. I'm not going to go over it in detail because we're not going to use it for this presentation. The same question, does differential privacy provide privacy? I could say clearly yes, because privacy is part of the name of this concept. Um, but the downside that this is, I mean, I think that's an upside, but maybe many people see it as a problem. It's a mathematical concept. It's not so easy to explain to those people who were uh, thinking about privacy for many years, to the philosophers and to the legal scholars. Um, it's a semantic condition on computation. So this is a green flag for us uh, computer scientists. We can also prove that it is robust to composition, the weakness that we uh, observed in chaonymity, one of the weaknesses there. Uh, we know that it allows by now, uh, a, 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 it allows a variety of uh, uh, computations like statistics and machine learning tasks. And there's a growing acceptance. First it was in theoretical computer science community, then in computer science, and then more widely and we're seeing implementations by the US Census and companies like Google, Apple, and Microsoft uh, of differentially private computations. So again, going back, does differential privacy provide privacy? Maybe that's not a very fair question to us because I, we never defined what privacy is. So how can we answer this? So now I'd like to, uh, go into like an attempt to, to 
try answering this question, what anonymity and differential privacy uh, provide privacy. And I, the, I will take the view uh, of, I'll try to take the view of, uh, you know, um, legal standards of privacy, assuming that they are in some correlation with uh, societal expectations of privacy. Let me begin with some, mention some related work. And maybe the first to mention is Helen Nissenbaum's uh, uh, notion of contextual integrity. So Helen Nissenbaum is a philosopher and she suggests this, suggested this framework for reasoning about privacy as norms about information flows between contexts. So this is a framework that combines something that is non-technical like norms with uh, some technical or seemingly technical concepts like in informational flows and context. It has not been defined using mathematical uh, language, so it's not formal from a mathematical standpoint, but there has been some work trying to formalize parts of contextual integrity, in particular this work by Bart et al, uh, took HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and tried to formalize requirements from HIPAA in logic, taking the, 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 uh, the firm, uh, using the framework of uh, 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 contextual integrity. And their logic uses predicates such as this one contains MQT. So this is a predicate that uh, in, if I say true, if message M uh, contains an attribute T about the individual Q, okay? But then the formalization does not specify how do we evaluate uh, this predicate given a message M, uh, should we consider it as one that contains attribute T about individual Q? And it may seem at first that this is an easy question to answer, but if you think about M as containing something that is an aggregate, for instance, or a, de a derivative of some information, then this becomes a lot less clear. Uh, how do you determine whether, <coughs> sorry, whether the message contains uh, uh, information about individual Q and whether that information is uh, attribute T? And it also feels that this binary determination may be like, wrong, like maybe this is more of a continuum than a, a binary thing. Second work I want to mention is a current project done at Harvard by Altman, Chung, and Wood uh, of robot lawyers. And this is project uh, attempts to generate automatically licenses for researchers that download their files from a social science data repository. It takes as input a lot of stuff like the formalization of the legislation and other work and, and license templates. And it, uh, the goal is to output human readable licenses. Okay. And again, they use logic in their formalization and that logic uses predicates such as FERPA data set in scope. FERPA is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act in the US. And another predicate is FERPA identifiable um, as basis for making decisions. But again, the formalization does not give us a specification of when is it that the data set should be considered uh, FERPA identifiable. And again, this is not an easy <coughs> question uh, to ask. If you look uh, to answer, if you look into FERPA, it does not give us crisp conditions on when uh, is data uh, identifiable and when, when it is not. Okay, can, uh, can you clarify, what does it mean a human readable license? Can you give an example? A human readable license, you mean? Yeah. This is uh, the, 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 the licenses that they generate will look like any uh, contract you've seen, uh, but using uh, pre-written paragraphs that are put in put together in order to form the license. Does it clarify it? It's very similar to uh, licenses that you've signed, say, when you list an apartment in, in the way that it looks. I mean, I'm not sure what this thing is doing. Who is 
asking for something and then who is giving that something in return? I see. Yeah, I, maybe, maybe if I'll have time, I can uh, describe that in more detail later on. Uh, it's, I'm sorry if this is a bit, a bit blurry here, but uh, the, the, the licenses are based on, so, so when, when people deposit data in, in this repository, they give information about the data set, for instance, uh, uh, what it contains, uh, who is the population, and so on. They also answer questionnaires about the data set so that uh, uh, information uh, about, um, so that uh, using this logic, one can try to determine whether it is verified identifiable or, or, or other stuff, probably. That is a, a, that will be a question of whether it is verified identifiable, and then based on all this information, um, the system will crunch a, a license that is uh, that looks like a, a, a like a, like like a contract the way we are used to see them, uh, and but the components of that contract will depend depend on the information that is collected from the data depositor and the information collected from the person who wants to use the data and the information that was coded about the formal requirements of the relevant legislation. Okay, now trying to answer this uh, question, at least partly, uh, what means that data set is perfectly identifiable and when it's not identifiable, um, we um, looked at the differential privacy and FERPA in, in this paper that uh, you can see at the bottom of the page. And so we examined FERPA and tried to come up with a mathematical definition of privacy from FERPA. Our definition is very conservative, probably much stronger than any other reader of FERPA uh, would, uh, would have, and probably much stronger than what the regulator uh, meant to have. But having a stronger definition means that if you satisfy it, then this is a very strong um, indication that you satisfy FERPA's requirements. But this definition may not be necessary to satisfy FERPA. And using this formulation, we provided the mathematical proof that the use of differential privacy satisfies the definition, and hence we believe also FERPA. There are many small details that I'm brushing out of the, the, the carpet here because uh, this deserves more than one slide, but I, I, I just don't have time for this. And maybe the last work I want to mention is recent work uh, that I was happy to see uh, on the archive in February this year by Gar Goldwasser and Vasu Devan. Uh, they look at the uh, right to be forgotten and um, they suggest technical definitions that represent possibilities for what that could mean or what the law could reasonably expect. To be honest, I didn't have uh, yet uh, digested this paper in full, so I cannot say much more uh, about it now. Maybe the next version of my slides. Now let me go into uh, this part. Maybe this is a time to pause for a question, if somebody has one. Okay. So now I want to go into this example, uh, this recent work with Aloni Cohen on formalizing and reasoning about singling out, which is a concept that comes from the European uh, general data protection regulation. The GDPR, the general, uh, general data protection regulation, is a regulation that many people see as a privacy regulation, a very strong privacy regulation, although the word privacy does not appear in the regulation even once. Uh, it replaces what was called the DPD, the Data Protection uh, Directive from 1995. Uh, it replaced it in uh, May 2018. Okay. Um, the GDPR 
is is a big document and it contains many clauses and these are uh, separated into two types there we have articles and we have recitals if i understand correctly articles are supposed to be more operative and recitals are supposed to be more um, explanatory although when you read them you see that sometimes articles are more explanatory and recitals are more operative so I, i'm not a hundred percent sure about this distinction Beginning to read into the GDPR, you, uh, the first article you see is Article 1, one that describes the scope of this regulation. And it says, this regulation lays down rules relating to the protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data. So if someone processes personal data, if a data controller processes personal data, then this regulation applies to that processing. And later on in Article 4, uh, it gives some definition of what personal data uh, means. They say personal data means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. And then this part, an identifiable natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly okay so we don't learn too much from this just that we know that in personal data uh personal data data is personal if it contains identifiable information we also learn maybe that the identification does not have to be direct it could be indirect and then in result 26 uh further explaining this they say to determine whether a natural person is identifiable, account should be taken of all the means reasonably likely to be used, such as singling out to identify the natural person directly or indirectly. So this still tells us uh, a few things. First, uh, if, you can, if you can use some means, including singling out, to identify the natural person, then the, 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 then the, that natural person is identifiable. Signaling out, by the way, is the only means mentioned in Versatile 26. So they don't give other examples of what would be considered reasonably likely, a means reasonably likely to be used. And another thing to note is that the DPD, the Data Protection uh, Directive, that preceded the GDPR also had a result 26 that looks also uh, almost the same word by word except that in the GDPR they added this example of singling out to the text okay so maybe somebody thought that singling out is an important concept to consider now, uh, what we learn is that if you can single out in your data, then information is identifiable and hence you have personal data, you are dealing with personal data and the GDPR applies. Now, we could hope that there would be a second, another restatement, maybe 715, that explains what singling out means. <coughs> but unfortunately, the, this pair of words singling out appears only once in the GDPR and we don't have another explanation of this concept in, in the document itself. That doesn't mean that we have to stop there because as any uh, or most uh, legal uh, regulations, there are um, other documents that help understand the uh, concepts that appear in the regulation. Now, the DPD, the Data Protection Directive, has set up a working party. It's called the Article 29 Working Party, which is an advisory board. And it, that board produced opinions, recommendations, and so on, in including interpretation of the um, Data Protection Directive requirements. Now, the DPD is not in effect anymore, and the working party was succeeded by the European Data Protection Board, the EDPB, under the GDPR. 
And for a while, I think there was an uncertainty with respect to uh, what is the status of the Article 29 working party documents. But in 2018, the EDPP has acknowledged the continuity of the work provided by the Article 29 working party and endorsed its document. So as long as the EDPP does not change these documents, they are in effect. Let's see what the Article 29 working party tells us about the singling out, okay? They say, as regards indirectly identified or identifiable persons, this category typically relates to the phenomenon of unique combinations, whether small or large in size. And then they continue, a name may itself not be necessary in all cases to identify an individual. This may happen when other identifiers are used to single someone out. So we see that you can single people either by name, single out people either by name, but you could also use other identifiers and these could be unique combinations. And furthermore, in another document, the Article 29 Working Party is examining several uh, privacy uh, technologies. You can see them on the left and you will recognize uh, canonymity and L diversity for the for, for the purpose of this uh, talk, they are the same. And you will also recognize differential privacy there on the left. And they examine them with respect to three, three uh, risks of which singling out is one. So let's look at this left-hand side of the table. They ask whether single out is still a risk and with respect to canonymity, they say no. So canonymity eliminates the risk. With respect to differential privacy, they say may not. And I leave that to your interpretation. But there is something a bit strange and dissatisfying here. We got used to thinking about differential privacy as a much stronger privacy measure than canonymity. And yet the Article 29 working party seems to think that anonymity is a better protection against singling out than differential privacy. So we are going to revisit this table at the end, at the end of the talk. Now, trying to understand uh, what singling out, um, the starting point for my work with Ohlone was a paper by Francis et al, where they suggested a definition for singling out, something that we now call isolation. The word isolation is not from their paper. And what they say singling out happens when there is exactly one person that has these attributes, okay? Here's an example. Suppose our data set is of uh, three users, uh, Netflix users that watched movies, okay? Uh, then in this data set, we could single it out by saying the user that saw uh, the movie, The Sting, only the third user uh, did that, or the user that watched Mulan between these dates, only the second uh, uh, user did, or the user that doesn't satisfy the previous two conditions, and this is only the first user in this table. Okay. So we could single out by uh, outputting a description that matches exactly one person in the data set. Now, uh, is, indeed, is it indeed that singling out should be interpreted as isolation? And for that, let me, uh, to answer this, let me, uh, and, and some other questions also, let me uh, begin with a simple uh, uh, setup, definition of a setup. So we are going to assume that our data set is drawn IAD from in a, a distribution D, okay? So we have N elements drawn from a, a, some unknown distribution. This data set is fed into a mechanism or analysis, and then this mechanism publishes some data. At this point, we have an adversary that tries to single out in the data set X. The way that the adversary tries to do that is by outputting a predicate, a description of possible rows in the data set X. And the adversary manages to uh, single out, in this case, single out means isolation, if this predicate holds, uh, it evaluates to true on exactly one 
entry of the data set. Okay, so that's the adversary's goal. So here's our first definitional attempt. This mechanism is secure against singling out if no adversary can isolate a row except by you know some strange luck with negligible probability. And the probability is over all the relevant randomness in this process. So uh, this seems to be uh, what um, uh, the, the, the paper by Francis et al. was suggesting. And also Alona and I had uh, a meeting with uh, their protection authority in, in Europe and, and, and they seem to think that this is the right definition. But the problem with that, uh, it's easy to show that this is impossible to achieve or at least very, very problematic. And the reason is the following. We can introduce what we call a trivial adversary. The trivial adversary does not get any information about the data set X. The adversary may know the underlying distribution. And we will see in a minute that this is not a strong requirement. So the adversary, even though it did not get any information about X, X tries to, to uh, single out, to isolate in the data set. Here's an example. If the data set contains 365 birthdays, then the adversary could choose the predicate born on October 23rd, and that would match uh, one over 365 fraction of the universe, okay, of the distribution D. And a simple calculation shows that this, by doing this, the adversary isolates with quite a high probability, 37%, okay? Definitely not negligible. So we see that uh, isolation can be done trivially. And of course, we can generalize this to a data set of any size. If we can pick a predicate P star that matches one over N fraction of the universe, then again, the same simple calculation shows that the probability of isolation is at least one over E, which is about 37%. And furthermore, it may seem that the attacker, the adversary, needs to know a lot about the underlying data set. But actually, using tools that we have, in particular the leftover hash lemma uh, and hashing, uh, it suffices that the underlying distribution D is mean entropic. And actually, you don't need so much mean entropy in order to uh, generate. A predicate that matches roughly one over n fraction of the universe, uh, the mean entropy has to be logarithmic in n. Okay. So we see that this can be very general, the ability to isolate without even looking or getting any information about the data. And that that's definitely is a problem. So can we fix this? In order to fix this, we begin by asking what makes an isolation non-trivial. And let's go back to our example. If the adversary outputs uh, this predicate born on uh, February 2nd, and the data set contains 365 birthdays, let's say random birthdays, then the attacker succeed with probability, if the attacker succeeded with probability 37%, percent were not impressed. This is doable even without access to the data. But if the attacker succeed with much a higher probability, let's say 99% of the time, then maybe this is non-trivial. Maybe more interestingly, if you look at a, a predicate like this that is extremely specific and we expect to be extremely rare, we don't even know, I don't even know if there is a person in the world that satisfies this, this predicate, and still, with outputting a predicate that is so rare, the attacker succeed with noticeable probability. And now I don't need to go up to 37% or 99%. Even 1% of success is going to be impressive. So what seems to make isolation non-trivial is improvement over baseline, a baseline that is set by the trivial adversary the one that does not get to see anything about the data. And that baseline depends on the rarity of that predicate. 
let me uh, formalize it a little more. We can very naturally define the weight of the predicate to be just the probability that it evaluates to true. Then the baseline is the probability that uh, an attacker without any access to the data manages to isolate with uh, a predicate of this weight. And a simple calculation gives this uh, formula. Let me just explore it uh, for a minute. Uh, this is the case that we saw. If the predicate is of weight roughly one over n, then the success probability, this is the baseline now, is about 37%. But now if you plug a negligible function into the baseline, you can see that uh, into, into the weight, you see that the baseline is also negligible. And this is the case that we are going to, um, to focus most of this uh, talk about. So I uh, want to define what it means to single out and in an act of uh, being careful, Aloni suggested that we're not going to call our uh, definition singling out but predicate singling out. So we have a qualifier here and this is also an invitation for everybody else to try to come and uh, provide alternative attempts to define signaling out so that we'll have a few of these and we'll be able to compare them and make better choices, uh, hopefully. Uh, in short, we call it PSO or PSO security. And let me define what it means. We say, first I will define what it means, what is the success probability to uh, perform uh, predicate signaling out, okay? That is uh, the probability that an adversary A manages to isolate in the data set X with the predicate that has weight less than a W. Okay, that's the subscript of the success function here. And now uh, we can define uh, security against uh, predicate signaling out to be. Um, the requirement for all negligible weights, the success probability is going to also be negligible. Okay, so we remain negligible. So the, if, if the trivial adversary does not have, uh, if the trivial adversary has negligible probability of succeeding, we also require that our real world adversary that does get to see the published data will also have a negligible probability of succeeding. Uh, Kobe? Yep. Yeah, uh, the definition now is for any x, not necessarily x that's drawn randomly. For any distribution. Of, it's still uh, the x is an IID of n samples from a distribution. It's not for any x. Exactly. It's for, uh, as you see in the probability, uh, x is taken IID from the uh, distribution. Okay, but do you have a, a definition for? Uh, arbitrary data sets? No, and this is a weakness that we'll go back to later on in, in the talk. This is an open question. A very good one. I wish I had an answer for it. And more generally, uh, we could, we don't have to stick with negligible probabilities. Uh, we could introduce these parameters, epsilon and delta, and say that the mechanism is epsilon delta W secure. If for all uh, distributions, adversaries, and weights less than W, I think it should be less than or equal to, um, the success probability uh, of the adversary is bounded by the baseline times the factor that depends on epsilon and maybe some additive delta, okay? But for the most of the talk, I'll focus on the definition that is now highlighted in, in yellow, which is weaker because does not deal with the higher weights, but it's still uh, interesting. So can we see, can we, uh, is this achievable at all? And let me give two examples. The first one uh, is a counting mechanism. So 
the mechanism M uh, is parameterized by a predicate Q, and we are interested in counting how many elements of the data set satisfy this uh, predicate. And the proof that this mechanism is PSO secure is very simple. There are only n plus one possible answers to this mechanism. Okay, the values between zero and n. Um, now, if an attacker has success probability uh, success of n, then the trivial adversary can guess the answer. And if the, if the answer is correct, that the trivial adversary will also succeed. So the, uh, the, the success probability of the trivial adversary is at least the success probability of the adversary A divided by the number of possible answers, which is n plus one. Or in other words, the success probability of the adversary is bounded by the baseline times n plus one. And because we're talking about a negligible baseline, this isn't going to be a negligible function. So this is nice because counting is a very basic uh, operation. We need counting for doing basic statistics and so on. It's nice that uh, predicate singling and single out allows uh, performing counting. And it suggests also that maybe almost any or any uh, attempt to uh, define signaling out should allow counting or something that is similar to counting. A second uh, example that I'm not going to uh, give a proof for is of a predicate mechanism. So again, uh, Q is a predicate here. And we evaluate Q on each row of the data set and we just output that. What these two examples also demonstrate is that both of them are mechanisms that are not differentially private because they are the, the deterministic computations. Differential privacy does not allow that. So differential privacy is not necessary for uh, predicate signal out security. Now I was worried about composition later on. So a natural question is whether this notion uh, composes, uh, self-composes, okay? So this is the question. We have L uh, mechanisms that are uh, pieces secure individually. What happens if we look at them as a single mechanism? Is it still uh, PSO secure? And uh, I will now show a theorem that, that they are not necessarily, okay? So in this theorem, uh, I'm going to use data that is generated uniformly. So we have N rows in this data set and each row has L bits in it, okay? We're going to use mechanisms that we know are uh, PSO secure, the counting mechanisms, we are going to have L plus one of them. And L is going to be omega of log N. Um, and here's how this would work. For the first mechanism, we're going to choose a, a, a predicate of weight one over N. As I discussed, this is something that is easy to do, even if we did not know the underlying distribution, just that, uh, the only assumption is that the distribution is mean entropic. So let's say we were successful. This would happen with 37%. Uh, in 37% of the time, we were successful. And actually, this predicates evaluates to one on exactly one row of the data set. Okay, and that is marked here. I'll call that row X star. And now we will try to learn the bits in this location, the bits of X star, the L bits. And the way we'll do it is we will form uh, queries. And each will reveal one bit of X star. For instance, the first query is this Q0 that isolated the row. And we also require that X1 is one. The count of Q1 is either zero or one. It's one if X1, if X star one is one and zero otherwise. And similarly, the second bit and the rest of the bits uh, in, this, in this row. So we learn 
uh, learn the L bits here. Note that L is super logarithmic. So we learn the predicate that has a negligible weight. This predicate is written below. Uh, we require that uh, X is X star. And we manage to isolate in this data set with a predicate that, is ha that has negligible weight. Okay. Um, what can, one can also uh, show that uh, piece of security does not self-compose even with two uh, uh, mechanisms. But before I do that, let me, or, or sketch that, let me just uh, uh, say this. this. This points that maybe to something that may be an inherent issue with the concept of singling out, because I, as I said, these scores are very common and natural. So they are probably likely allowed by uh, any or most interpretations of the concept. So maybe the concept itself has an issue. And with respect to two mechanism, let me just sketch this. We take the data set and we uh, apply an extractor on the first n minus one rows of the data set to generate what should look like a random seed. And we prove that this is secure against uh, predicate singling out. And the second mechanism encrypts the last row of the data set with this, with this uh, secret S. And we prove that this by itself is also secure against predicate singling out. But when we put them together, you can recover the last uh, row of the data set. And hence, this is not secure against predicate singling out. Now let me go to uh, the last part of, of this discussion and ask whether these, this concept has legal consequences, whether we can now go back to uh, paradigms like differential privacy and anonymity and ask whether they protect against this concept of predicate singling out. And if we believe that this concept uh, uh, models well enough, the the concepts of singling out from the GDPR, then these are relevant questions to whether the use of these uh, technologies satisfies the legal requirement. So let me begin with the easy part, differential privacy and predicate singling out. And we can prove that differential privacy protects against predicate singling out. And interestingly, the proof is via connection to a recent line of work on the generalization properties of differential privacy. Um, I will not give the details here. The proof is quite simple once, once you use the, the, right, the right lemma. Um, now let me go to canonymity and ask what a canonymity uh, provides, uh, protects again predicate singling out. I'll, and I will show two, uh, two uh, arguments here. The first is more like an example. Let's say our data set uh, is such that each row is random in the range one to two to the n, okay? And the k-anonymizer performs the following. It sorts the data. So here I drew the solid data. And then it divides it up to chunks of k consecutive rows and uh, for each three, it outputs the interval. So clearly, uh, all the three elements, three, eight, and 27, are in the interval three to 27. And you see this is three anonymous because no, uh, every row appears at least three times. But is this uh, a PSO secure? And it's easy to see that no, because these intervals in their endpoints reveal entries from the data. Okay, for instance, we could take from the third in interval here, the number 343, and uh, require that as, as our predicate. We managed to single out, okay? And, and furthermore, the weight of this predicate is negligible, okay? So we have a problem here. Let me, but this may not look like a general way of how canonymity is being used. So let me go back to this question with a more general 
example. So suppose this is our data set, we re anonymize it, it looks like this now. So each row appears three times. And here are some observations. First, uh, we can look at the, the definition of each chunk as a predicate. Okay, like the, whatever the predicate, what is written in that chunk defines, is satisfied by, but by elements that correspond to that chunk, by rows that correspond to that chunk. Okay, so we have in this case n over three uh, such predicates. And furthermore, can anonymization procedures are designed to suppress as little as possible from the, from the information. Okay, so typically the weight of these predicates is going to be negligible. Okay, think about uh, can anonymizing uh, data in a way that is useful for science. You want to keep as much as possible from the data there. Hence, the, the predicates are um, have have um, a tiny weight. So what can we do? How can we uh, create a single out adversary in this case? We can choose a trivial uh, um, predicate with weight one over k, okay, and then use one of the uh, predicates that the K anonymizer has outputted for us, okay? And our predicate is going to be the, uh, what is that, conjunction of P trivial and one of these predicates. Let's see, fire one, let's say fire one. The weight of this predicate is clearly less than the weight of fire one, and hence it's negligible. But, because we did this, we get a predicate that isolates with, with high probability, and hence it's much above the baseline. In the picture, this is what happens. We're taking these elements, we are applying them into a trivial uh, uh, predicate. Here we're going to use, again, uh, the leftover hash lemma. We need to be a bit careful about uh, the conditional entropy, mean entropy here, but it, it does work. And, and here, so we isolate with probability that is greater than 37%. So what do these mean for the GDPR compliance? So let me return to this caveat that, uh, that Avi uh, also hinted to. It may be that this definition, PSO security, is too weak for capturing the GDPR knowledge of singling out. And in particular, what we are worried about is this assumption that the data set is drawn IID from some underlying distribution. And another issue is that we assume that there is no auxiliary knowledge that the adversary has on the data set. Actually, this weakness is demonstrated, I think, by in some sense by the uh, proofs that um, that the concept does not self-compose. Uh, but let's focus uh, on the fact that X is drawn IAD from D. In a sense, we are covering maybe the easier case. When there are uh, relationships between entries of X, it may be even easier for an adversary to single out. So what this means is that the positive results, like the fact that differential privacy satisfies PSO security, this has a restricted Im implication. Uh, we believe that preventing, because maybe this is a weaker uh, requirement, uh, requirement than what the regulator meant, uh, preventing these attacks is necessary, but not necessarily sufficient. And with respect to differential privacy, it means that we need further analysis to make a decision of whether the use of differential privacy satisfies the requirements. But because we weaken the, the, the requirement, the negative results are actually quite strong. And they are, we believe they are legally meaningful. We restricted the scope of this uh, definition so the negative results are stronger. And in particular, we believe that it means that k likely doesn't pr provide 
uh, sufficient protection against the GDPR singling out. And actually, if you think about the, the second attack I showed with anonymity, it suggests that anonymity is actually doing most of the work for the, un, for the attacker. It provides this predicate that applies for a small number of, um, uh, of, of individuals and has a small weight. And then identifying, uh, isolating within a group of K is really a piece of cake. This is our trivial uh, adversary. So back to this table that I showed you earlier on, uh, we suggest that when the EDPB would reconvene, they would uh, reconsider this uh, uh, recommendation, this conclusion. I have to say that unlike the uh, um, analysis that we provide in the paper, the, we don't have access to the analysis done by the Article 29 working party. So we don't know exactly what led their conclusion that um, chaonimity uh, actually uh, uh, removes the risk of singling out. Okay, surprisingly, I'm almost in time. Uh, and let me just summarize, and then I would be happy if there are questions or ideas that uh, people have about this. So what we did is we uh, tried to create some um, relationship between technical concepts and legal concepts from the GDPR. We started with the GDPR notion of singling out we came up with our definition of PSO security going in the way through on the way through this idea of isolation. Uh, then once we had a definition, a mathematical definition, one of the benefits was that we could examine its properties. And an important property of privacy definitions is that they should self-compose. We see that uh, PSO security does not uh, compose. And we believe that this points the, to maybe to uh, that this points to an inherent weakness in this notion of singling out. Okay, does not mean that this is a notion that has to be thrown away uh, through through the window, but probably not a notion that should be uh, just used by its own. Maybe in combination with other requirements, then we could uh, examine these technologies and learn that anonymity is not, uh, canonization is not PSO secure. And we believe that this has legal implication with respect to canonization and that differential privacy is, is PSO secure. And we believe this gives some evidence that differential privacy does prevent the singling out, but further uh, analysis is needed there. You, can, you see uh, arrows going in both directions here. One more direction we would like to see, one more arrow, sorry, is, is this one. Uh, whether we can go from this technical analysis and the definition of uh, PSO security and suggest a legal concept that is predicate on, on, on our uh, analysis and, and see if, if, if uh, that concept is going to be accepted by the, the, the European experts in the EDPB. And I think this is where I will finish. There are a few references uh, to papers that I uh, managed, uh, that I mentioned here. The first one is this work with Aloni that uh, came out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and the two other papers that are on, on this slide. And thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you very much. So, um, any questions for Kobe? This is a good time. I'm sorry, I have a question. Uh, so it's back to my uh, original question about the a uh, special type of data sets that you use, which are independent doors from a distribution. Um, uh, if you just take an arbitrary one uh, and apply differential privacy, do you know that it uh, 
doesn't supply, are there examples where it doesn't supply uh, predicate singling out, or uh, what kind of examples clearly violate this? So again, it's not clear to me what singling out would mean in, in this setting when the, the data is not IAD. Now, with differential privacy, of course, if the data is highly uh, correlated, okay? Let's say we know that the data um, is, is a range of numbers, so consecutive and consecutive numbers, but we don't know where it begins, okay? So, for instance, if we could compute the average, we could single out in that case. In some settings, depending on the range, differential privacy would allow us to compute the average, right? Yeah. So that would be a case where uh, there is a lot of uh, correlation between the data, a lot of dependency between the data elements, and even with differential privacy, we'll be able to isolate. Now, it seems kind of an unfair game because of this very strong dependency, and I think a good definition that takes into account the possibility of such dependencies should um, kind of parameterize the, the dependency and, and allow um, and, 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 and have weaker requirements as the, that dependency grows. Well, I think, okay. Yeah, thanks. So I also have a question. So what do you think about this notion of singling out? So you, you say it might not be a good idea. Yeah. So, so I, I have to say, uh, I, one, one thing is that this work and also the other works on FERPA should not be seen as endorsing the, 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 um, the concepts that appear in, in legal standards of privacy. I think in many cases, these concepts are too weak and, and also in many cases they don't uh, match our current understanding like you could think about them as sort of a, like a uh, desirata fantasy okay they 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 they, they, they uh, expect more than is possible okay yeah like here but, they're too strong absolutely what's that it seems that singling out is too strong not too weak no, I think it's not strong enough, actually. But, um, but, but anyway, it's a concept that has weaknesses, okay? And so, so but, but on the other hand, we don't have a lot of options. These are the laws that we have, and we have to work with these regulations and with these laws. So what do we do, okay? I think part of the work should be like what we're doing here, try to take these concepts and cast uh, cast meaning into them uh, in a way that matches our current mathematical understanding of, of information privacy, but also try to work in the other direction and help hopefully the legal community understand the, the problems with these concepts and replace them with concepts that make more sense. Now, with respect to singling out, as I said, on one hand, it's a concept that clearly has weaknesses, and if the, the fact that it does not self-compose, I think is a strong, uh, it's a big issue. But on the other hand, I think it also shows some improvement. The concepts that, are, uh, that we see in American uh, laws, uh, usually they speak about identification, and it seems that here the Europeans has ra have raised the bar on identification. So uh, it is kind of ingrained in American law that you could de-identify data by erasing some information. And, but the identification in the end is the ability to uh, put a name on a record. Whereas here they're saying you don't really have to put the name of, on the record you it's enough that you can create a unique combination and that would already be seen as you know singling out 
And I think that makes sense to some extent because a lot of the link, linkage attacks that we've seen have performed singling out as, as a stepping stone towards complete um, identification. So first you find the unique combinations and then you try to match them with an external data set that identifies the data. And in a sense, they were saying here, let's not wait for the second uh, stage. Let's kill it uh, as, uh, once we can uh, uh, create these unique uh, combinations. So both uh, like progress, but um, so I think there is progress, but more, maybe not enough in, in, in the concept, in this concept uh, in, in the European law. Any more questions, everybody? I would just add to what uh, Kobe said. Hi, this is Aloni. I haven't met many of you. Um, that I think that the situation in the US is changing. Um, and what we had in the US are lots of privacy laws that got passed in like the late 90s to the early 2000s, and then no change. Um, and now after GDPR, lots of countries and cities and states are passing new privacy laws. So what we see in California, um, the new privacy law in California that just went into effect January 1st, um, does expand the, the scope of what's regulated to be much more in line with what's regulated in Europe, and which is a big expansion over what HIPAA protects and what FERPA protects, so these tra more traditional U.S. privacy laws. Yeah, I think generality is definitely a, a good, uh, like the, the going to more general uh, data protection and privacy regulations is a good step. Uh, the fact that in the US there are so many regulations, but each of them only covers a tiny part of the of, of this story. I think we have regulation that has kind of more holes than, than coverage and, and going to more general um, data protection regulation is definitely a, a good direction. What is it like talking to these people? <laughs> Remember, you're being recorded. <laughs> so, uh, what can I say being recorded? Um, so, I think it is, uh, so a big challenge is to find the right people to talk with. And I think I've been lucky in finding collaborators that, uh, I mean, outside computer science, it was very easy to talk to Aloni. <laughs> but uh, I, I've been lucky in finding collaborators that we, over quite a long period of time, I think by now it's six or seven years, have developed you know, our language and explained to each other what we're doing and, and, and trust and agreement in the work. But this is also one of the reasons it goes so slowly. Um, so on one hand, when you are talking with these people, it is encouraging. There is a lot of interest and there is a lot of goodwill there. When you're talking to the wrong people, then it, the feeling is a feeling of despair, frankly. <laughs> so yeah, it is going between uh, being hopeful and, and feeling despair. Uh, depends on, you know, who, what kind of feedback you're getting and whom you're talking with. Yeah. But the people, I think also the people interested, like the, 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 the optimistic people, also there's a lot of uh, legwork you have to do in explaining basic concepts and just how, how we even approach problems and define things and what boxes with arrows coming out of them mean. Mm -hmm. um, starting from zero in some senses. So, yeah. so, so one of the things that you, that way too, even if you have the right audience. Sorry, Eric? I was just wondering about this uh, table with the K and maybe anonymity uh, no or yes, and the differential privacy may not. Have you gotten any response to this work from the people who made this table? Not directly. I mean, we had, again, like I told about one meeting that Aloni and I had, I think it was more than a year ago, 
presenting yeah. some ideas from this to um, to their protection officers from from Europe. Uh, I think then it was kind of met with with a shock. Uh, maybe that's the best <laughs> description. Uh, and but one one of one of our goals now, and and one of the reasons we try to pursue a publication in, in a journal like PNAS was trying to get to this wider audience, and I hope that we will get to this data protection um, authorities in Europe, that some of them are going to be interested in what's going on there. Another thing is that I think a lot, is, a lot depends on explaining it right to, to this audience. And right I mean um, finding the language that, that, uh, that explain it with explains these ideas with accuracy but does not require them to to do all the math or to necessarily understand uh, uh, probability and so on. And that takes a lot of uh, uh, work. This is not easy to do. Uh, at Harvard, we spend a lot of work on writing on differential privacy for what we call the non-technical audience. And still, I remember like in a conference where we presented this, there were some people saying, you know, I cried when I read you know, pages 19 to 27 because they were too mathy for me. Um, uh, so this is an ongoing effort to, um, to take our concepts or take the way that we think and explain it to an audience that has a very different language, that they use words that are similar to the ones that we're using, but they have different meanings and the way that they argue is different from ours. And also in some cases, the values that, that are, you know, are ingrained in the discipline is different from the values that are ingrained in our discipline. And yeah, that's, I, I, but overall, I think it's exciting and, and, and fun to do it. Even if I said that sometimes I despair, <laughs> I think overall, uh, I, I find this as an exciting uh, line of work, and I also find exciting the fact that we can take tools that were developed in theoretical computer science and use them in this analysis. This is not something that I could expect before starting doing this work. It's like when Irit is trying to talk about buildings to civil engineers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think they're doing uh, much better than that. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's, uh, it's uh, fantastic. So thank you very much. And uh, see you everyone next week.